it was on a Wednesday, mm -hmm. and uh, Sunday, the 4th of July, uh, or the celebration was washed out or something. Then my mother said, well, how about just the women and the kids going out to Union Park for a day? That was a, a, a real treat, one, one day of the summer. Everybody loaded up with your picnic baskets and got on the streetcar and went out to Union Park. It cost a whole nickel to go out. What I could remember of it was we left home, it was, oh, it was so hot that day. It was, and of course you dressed up in your Sunday best. You wore your best clothes to the park and then you took your old to play in. And I was all ready and I was busy waiting. I can remember walking back and forth and I was seven years old at the time. And we went on the streetcar well, we got to the park, and then we met the the rest of the relatives there, like Ann Fern and Aunt Nell and their families, yeah. and got the, you know how you pick out a pavilion? Mm -hmm. You think which is the best? And they picked this one out, well, I guess it was, it was the biggest one. There were so many of us. We used to like to go in the cave out there, and then there were oodles and oodles of swings and rides, you know. The cave wasn't the biggest attraction, but all the rides they had for kids, and that's what you really did, you know, go on all the rides. And the park was really quite long. The, the really the thing I remember is playing in the pool. Yeah. That was the big thing for me, just playing in that wading pool. But it started to rain, and uh, so my mother said, uh, you kids better get in this pavilion and get your feet washed and get your clothes on because we're going to leave the park where there's terrible storms coming in. So they all come into the pavilion and, and, you know, wash their feet off and put their good clothes on. And uh, then it started to rain terribly hard. And uh, they, they, we had picnic baskets and the women all started you know, loading up the stuff. Well, by the time everybody was in that pavilion and uh, they were all ready to go, why all of a sudden... Just like that, just like a tornado, you know. We looked up and there's this great huge wall of water. It, and I mean huge well, wall of water, all mud. Just came on down that valley. And I remember her mother saying, we better start saying the rosary, we're in danger. We were, we started to say the rosary. We did say the rosary. Yeah, we started, started saying the rosary. Well, we, the, the older people start looking out after the younger people go. Mm -hmm. Because I remember my mother, see my brother was only three, she had him. And my grandmother, she had me and my sister. And we were leaning against the railing there because they, the women said, well, we have to stay on this side of the pavilion because when the water gets so high, it's going to take it, and we don't want to go on the other side because there's sewers over there, mm -hmm. and we don't want the bodies washed in the sewer. Well, we didn't, we didn't in just a few minutes, I just wall of water just came down and washed everybody, body and soul and picnic baskets and everything right out of that pavilion. Graham still had a hold of me, and a big plant came along and knocked my sister from my grandmother's arms, so my sister was floating by herself, and she got caught in something, I don't know what. And of course, naturally, she drowned. And then uh, I remember Grandma and I were floating, and I was busy swallowing water, and somebody reached down and pulled us up onto a plank, one of the workmen. I could swim, and, and uh, you kept looking for something to grab onto. Everything was coming. Chairs and and everything. The wood of that pavilion was all torn apart. And uh, there was a, a big tree and my youngest sister was washed up into that tree. I can hear me sitting on that side and all that water underneath. And it sat and sat and talked. Some men, when the water went down, some, a man came out and uh, 
took it off in that sign and carried me to shore. I, I guess I was sort of scared. I, if I wouldn't have hung out of that, I'd probably drop right in that bloody water. And that, that theater, that, after the flood just went right through it, you know. And, uh, and her mother and, and sister and little brother were washed through that theater because the water was there, so forceful that the rest of us, we were washed on down. And they were building a roller coaster out there. And there was a, a lot of lumber. There were, I don't know, there were quite a few workmen out there that day. So this lumber hit this roller coaster and uh, it slowed down the, the flow of the water, you know. And uh, all I can remember is scrambling up on the top of that, uh, that pile of wood. And my sister was there. Well, after we were rescued, you see, uh, there were these benches up on the side of the hill. And I don't know how I got up there, or even how my mother got up there, but I know I was sitting on the bench alongside of her, and she was, you know, where's Bertie at? Why doesn't Bertie come? So then my Aunt Nell came over and she said, well, they found Bertie, but she's dead. And but she said, now don't feel bad about it. She said, she said, I lost one too. And I know my mother just really went into a terrible hysterics. Because with her oldest child, you know. And there was a bond between those two. As soon as they pulled me out of the water, some woman had me. I think it was up to that house, you know, where they were taking care of everybody. And they kept fanning me and saying, don't go to sleep, don't go to sleep. And then this lady was holding me on the streetcar. Don't go to sleep, don't go to sleep. Well, then I didn't know anything until I didn't know I was in the hospital. I don't even remember who took me home out of the hospital. But I thought it was so funny my mother wasn't there to be with me. I don't know who told me she was dead or anything. Not, but I remember the three caskets were in the living room at home. Somebody carried me in there to look at them. Yeah, the sad part of it is there are people that, you know, were so helpful and yet they're, now they're forgotten. Yeah. See, the, those men really never got the credit that they deserved. No, they really that, didn't. You know, saved so many people out there. Well, I don't know who pulled me out. And my grandmother, because we were still together, the two of us. I guess they just reward in heaven. Yeah, same. There's still a lot of stuff to see. I mean, you go down there and, you know, you look at this place and you, you knew something big was down there, you know, just from the size of the foundations. And, and of course, there's, you know, the wading pool and the swimming pool and that. Well, the general area that we're in right now is known as the Loop. This was where the trolleys came in from town and they came up through the valley where 52 is up this way and they came in on the right and circled around and there was a big elaborate waiting station in front of us and they'd let people off at the waiting station. It was covered, sheltered, they had benches and such underneath so you could wait out of the rain or the sun. Uh, the people would get off the trolleys and then the trolley would exit and go along the left hand side of the loop and go back down and it took approximately about 20 minutes to ride all the way out to the park. Uh, the area behind us here was where the caretaker's house was located. It was called the Lodge. Joseph Bonds and his wife and his 11 children lived here at the park. The house was provided by Union Park. 
Uh, he was in charge of maintenance and uh, he was a big horticulturist so he had greenhouses in back of his house and he was in charge of all the plantings and taking care of the shrubbery and whatever needed to be to be done. Um, like I said, his greenhouses were up behind there. Uh, you don't see anything left. The only uh, evidence that there's a house is there's an old root cellar back up in the hillside that they use to keep perishables cold and that. Um, the big tree here in front of us is a white pine and that was an original planting that they had put in the ground when the park was opened and when they put it in it was probably only maybe five six foot tall and you can see now over the years how much that tree has grown so it's well over 100 years old easily. All right, the area we're in now was known as the Roller Coaster Valley. Uh, they had a huge wooden roller coaster that ran up the valley and back down. It was, as I said, made out of wood and it was real rickety. But we have a photograph of it and it shows, oh gosh, I don't know, it looks like it's at least probably 20 or 30 foot tall. It was quite an attraction down here. Uh, you took... Uh, a token to ride it, they didn't charge money, you bought a token to ride on it. And I'm not sure how long it took, but it was probably long enough to scare the pants off of you if it shook back and forth as much as some old people have told me. But the area that you're looking at now is known as the fish pond. And the name fish pond is kind of uh, incorrect because actually what they were used for was water reservoirs. I talked to an old lady that had come out here when she was a kid and she says no, it was a holding tank for water because she says I can remember that all along the outside edge were bubblers where you could get a drink and she'd say I was always afraid because the noise down here and she could never figure you know what was making all the noise but here up on the hillside maybe 15-20 yards back in there was the pump house that pumped the water all throughout the park and I guess it must have made quite a racket. The area that we're in now was one of the most well-developed areas of the park. Right over in that direction there, there was a dance pavilion. Um, people could come and dance or sit and listen to music. It was a completely covered in structure. Uh, across the creek there was a bowling alley. Um, Right out in front were the bridges. They had a little refreshment stand, an ice cream stand. Uh, this was all terraced off and uh, benches. There was a planter in front of us that was uh, a lot of shrubbery and trees and that. Uh, the sidewalk would have run up right to the dance pavilion and on either side they had small ponds with marble fountains in them. Up on the hillside, on opposite of the sidewalk, there was a structure called the Rustic Bandstand, the first Rustic Bandstand. It was an open air type thing. It was built uh, Adirondack style, all out of wood, and various musical groups would play music so the picnic goers and people out here would have a little entertainment. Um, you can see the steps going up the hill, which would have led to the rustic bandstand and uh, trails and everything up behind it. And on this side would have been all lined with benches and people could sit and watch uh, picnic goers walk by, listen to the music. But What's left of the structure we're looking at now was once the Mammoth Theater. Uh, this was the largest theater at that time in uh, 1909 when it was built west of the Mississippi. So it was a huge, enormous uh, building. It stretched from one side of the valley all the way over to the other side. Uh, it held like 1,500 people inside of it. Uh, there was various forms of seating. Uh, the inside they had nice cushioned upholstered seats that would cost you 15 cents if you didn't want to spend that much. The next level back there was wooden bleachers. And if you wanted to see the show for free, the back end of the theater was completely open and you could sit on bleachers outside and look right straight in. Back when they built it, it cost $15,000 to build. Uh, quite popular with the park goers. There would be musical acts, uh, plays, different forms of entertainment down here. Before us is what's left of uh, one of the sidewalks that ran through the park and 
as you can see it's pretty much broken up and, and, and shattered uh, back when the park was open though this would not have had water on it over the years the water picked the easiest course to come down and it picked the sidewalk actually when the park was open the creek was on the opposite side of where we are now and ran along the back of the hillside so this area here was a lot flatter and more open too and from the creek being down here it uh, deposited a lot of soil and silt in that over the years so the, the ground has gotten built up. You can see what's left uh, sticking out of the ground of one of the original iron lamp posts. The bottom of that is probably at least four foot down so you can see over time how much this area has built up. This particular area that we're in now was known as the children's playground. This was one of the most popular areas of the park. Uh, they had a wading pool, which is here in front of me. Actually, this one was built in miniature to one in Ogden Park in Chicago. It is about a foot deep on the curved end and then a few inches deep up on the other end. Uh, there was an open air pavilion that sat at the end of it where the moms could watch their kids. And in a lot of the old postcards, you'll see the kids wading in the pool and they've got their uh, skirts, the girls with their skirts and the boys with their good clothes, uh, their pants pulled up and, and wading, having a good time. Um, up above it, there would have been a lot of the swings and slides and, and merry-go-rounds and that. And further past that, sat where what is known as the Death Pavilion. When the flood hit the park, July 9th, 1919, that was the pavilion that the family reunion from East Dubuque was on and ended up five people off of that pavilion drowned out here that day during a flash flood. Uh, after the flood, they rebuilt the park, but they never rebuilt the Death Pavilion. Most of the park was rebuilt uh, exactly as it was, where the Death Pavilion sat they built a swimming pool, an Olympic-sized swimming pool. It's 50 by 100 and 8 foot deep at one end. Uh, they also built a road out to the park in hopes of trying to keep it open because by that time, um, people weren't interested in coming out to the park anymore for fear of another flash flood or because automobiles were now more easily affordable and people were going out of town and other attractions, but they just couldn't get enough attendance, so the park finally closed down in uh, 1934. It sat empty for about 10 years, and the YMCA bought it in 1946 for a camp for kids, and they still own it to this day.